Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. How about we uh, start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and all the prayer, all the graces that you bring to our lives. I ask that you would bless this time, that it be a time to grow in our faith, grow in our knowledge of you, and encounter your, your power and your goodness. Help us to live lives that give you glory and honor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight's topic, as you can see, is, um, is the Bible the only authority? And so we're kind of moving into a little bit of more um, polemics, a little bit more um, debate, you know, where, uh, where our beliefs are kind of opposed by other, other systems or other denominations. You know, we've talked about what evidence do we have that, that there is truth, that does God exists, that Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth, and that Jesus Christ started the Catholic Church. Well, now we need to cover, if we're going to do a why Catholicism, why Catholic, some a little bit more, um, what are these uh, major issues that divide Christians? And there really is nothing major, mo- nothing more major than divine revelation, the issue of authority, the issue of the Word of God. Um, you know, that's one of the major defining things. Half of all Christians on the planet are Catholic. 25% are Orthodox, which agree with us on most things, but don't follow the Pope, won't listen to the authority of the Pope, don't believe in papal infallibility and some other things. And then, uh, and then the other 25% are Protestant, who don't believe in sacred tradition and believe that the Bible is the only authority and that there's no such thing as a magisterium or anything like that. So... It's one of those big dividing issues that I think it's important for us to tackle when we're looking at why are we Catholic. So, tonight's topic, we're going to talk about um, the need for divine revelation. Do we actually, why, why did God even reveal himself? The stages of revelation, which we touched on a little bit last time with the whole foundation of the church. The modes of transmitting the word of God. This is the big issue. How did God set up, what system did he set up to transmit his word? And then the Catholic versus Protestant belief on divine revelation. Okay. Oh, and then also the canon of Scripture. How did the Bible come about? Oh, and I just remembered. Dorothy, would you do me a huge favor? Sure. On the um, copier is a handout, or that is my own notes. It's not a handout, but it's my notes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. See what happens when you have a key card? I just ask you to do things. So Abraham, I don't know if you want a key card because it means more work. I'll just ask you to randomly do things. <laughs> All right. So I remember, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this story in uh, this context or not, but uh, you know, I've gotten into various conversations with, with groups of people. And I remember talking to this girl who um, was a friend of mine, but we were going back and forth, basically trying to convert each other. And, you know, it's fine. It happens. You know, I get into conversations where they're trying to convert me and I'm trying to convert them. I'm okay with it, you know, because I'm pretty confident that I'm, you know, standing on solid ground here. So we had this whole conversation about Scripture and various issues, and I don't even remember all the issues. It was calling the man Father, or Eucharist, or Confession, you name it, just kind of bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around. And finally, we, finished, we were getting towards the end of the conversation, and she was getting frustrated, I was getting frustrated, and so we're walking out, and she... She just looks at me, um, kind of in this exasperated voice, and says, I stand on the Bible alone. And I thought to myself, interesting. I stand on the Bible alone. An interesting, interesting difference there. Because my answer is, I stand with the church. You stand alone, I stand with the church. And so I want to talk about what did that looks like? For her, that was a safe, that was like the most safe thing she could think to say. I stand on the Bible alone. But what she doesn't didn't realize is is the major difference there is alone. Without anyone else. And you know one of the tactics of the evil one is divide and conquer. If he can get you alone, he can pick you off. She thought that it was a place of being safety, of being safe. And for me, I did not think at all. And I remember um, years before this, even before I, um, before I came back to the Catholic Church, when I was still trying to figure out denominations, what, what, you know, what religion am I going to be, all this stuff, 
I had a friend who became a, was going to go off and be a Lutheran, Lutheran seminarian and is now a Lutheran pastor. And I remember him um, saying, you, you know, he handed me a Bible and said, you just need to read this. This has all the answers. And, I, and I, my first, my gut reaction, which now I can think was so utterly Catholic, and I, I, but I didn't know this at the time, I'm thinking, this is a big book. Are you saying that I have to figure all this out myself? That's a terrifying thought. Here is a 2,000-page book, depending on how large your, top, fight, your font type is. You know, here's a 2,000-page book. Go figure out what God wants. Wow. Uh, is, that, is that the system? Is that the system that God set up? Here's the book. You figure it out. Your, 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 your interpretation is just as good as anyone else. Well, so let's, let's review a little bit some, from, the, from, the, from, uh, from some of it. Of course, looking at truth, we remember... What is truth? Truth is the mind's correspondence to reality. When our reality, when our minds perceive reality the way it actually exists. Um, and then there are two different levels of truth. There are natural truths, like this is a table, or this is a podium, this is a computer mouse. And then there are supernatural truths. Truths that are not capable of being known just by reason alone, but have to be revealed. Truth, supernatural truths about God. So we can know that God exists just by reason alone, but that he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is only knowable by divine revelation. Um, so when we look at supernatural truths, we look at why would God actually reveal himself? You know, it's one of the core beliefs is that, uh, that defines us as Catholics, that God has actually revealed our religion. He's revealed the truths about himself, that we are not a man-made religion, we are a, excuse me, we are a God-man made religion that God has established. You know, that's where um, a lot of people will argue and say, oh, all these religions are just man-made things. And so, well, yeah, I'd be against it if it was a man-made religion too, where a man-made religion is a guy or girl thinks of some ideas as a way to get to God. And there's, you know, there may have, they may have some true things, may have some false things about it. A divinely established religion, a religion based on revelation is, God speaks to man about the way to get back to him, about the way to get to him, to be in a relationship with him. And so, has God revealed himself? Well, we first look at, um, is it logical to? No. Whether God has revealed himself or not is, um, is one thing, but is it at least, does it at least make sense? Well, yeah. I mean, life's greatest questions would require re- revelation. Why does anything exist at all? No science, no nothing, nothing on this planet except divine revelation can reveal that. Why is there something rather than nothing? Science cannot answer that question. Okay? Uh, what is the meaning of our lives? What's the purpose of our lives? Who is God? Who is he? Does he care about us? Is there anything after death? How do I get to heaven? How do I get to spend eternity with God? We can never fully know the answer to these questions without divine revelation. And these are the most important, most, some of the most important questions we can ask. So it makes sense that if God created us and we have these questions in our heart, it would at least make sense that he would reveal himself to us. Otherwise, it'd be kind of cruel if God is, if God is good and did not reveal himself. It'd be, like, it'd be like me giving a, a laptop to a caveman. He'd be like, what is this? Or he'd more be like, blah, 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 blah. You know? <laughs> I'd be like, it's a laptop. Blah, 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 blah. What am I supposed to do with this? I'm not telling you. Again, he'd be more like, blah, blah, blah. you know, I'd be like, I don't know. He would use it as a club or a coaster or try to eat it. You know, it would totally, it would break before he ever really appreciated what, it, what I was handing to him. And it, at least, even St. Thomas Aquinas, many of the saints, he said, it makes sense that God would reveal himself to us because we, um, have the, we are made for God, we have this need for him, and that um, it would take an insane long amount of time to try to figure out many of the important truths. The, that path would be filled with errors, and... Each person needs to encounter God. They need salvation. They need truth. So it makes sense that God would reveal himself from the beginning. Of course, we look at history to see if he actually does, which of course he does. All right. So we have a need for revelation because 
not only do we have these questions, but we need more than just truth. We actually need God himself. You remember, you probably are all familiar with the quote from St. Augustine. You have made us for yourself, O Lords, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That we need more than just guidance for life. We need God for life. We need him himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need God himself. With so high a calling, is it reasonable that God would reveal himself and his truth to us? Yes. And so the Catechism in, in, chapter, in paragraph 51 says this, a great quote, It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. His will that was that men should have access to the Father through Christ, the Word made flesh, in the Holy Spirit, and thus become sharers in the divine nature. I think it's a beautiful line. Why did God reveal himself to man? It pleased him to. It pleased him out of his, it is, it pleased God in his goodness and wisdom. He chose, he freely chose to reveal himself to us. He didn't have to. It made sense for him to, but he didn't have to. Why? So that we could have access to the Father through Christ, that we could become sharers in the divine nature. Beautiful, beautiful. And we see in scripture, and we see throughout history, that God, when he reveals himself, this is very Catholic, very important. He reveals himself both in words and in actions, deeds. That God just doesn't speak to man, he parts the Red Sea. God just doesn't speak to Moses, he you know, rains down um, uh, uh, fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he acts. Uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was Abraham's time. But anyway, um, he, God, when he speaks, he does stuff. God is both... Um, uh, speaking, to, guiding to us, and acting in history, which is a very Catholic thing, that God works with history. Okay. All right. So we look at now the stages of divine revelation. How does God reveal himself? Well, God wants to reveal himself in his will. And so what happens? The Lord speaks to a prophet. You see this throughout the scriptures. He speaks to a prophet, commands him to give that message to the people. Of course, the prophet delivers the message to the people, and the Lord backs up his message with mighty deeds oftentimes. You know, go, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I go I, goes and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Doesn't, and then boom, the plagues. And then that message is then handed down from generation to generation. This is the pattern. So then now the question comes up, if this is the pattern, God speaks to a prophet, the prophet delivers the message, the message is backed up by words and deeds, and then the message is handed on. How is it handed on today? without corruption, without misinterpretation. Well, the same way that happens in the Old Testament, the same way that happens in the New Testament. The Old Testament, God the Father reveals himself in his plan for our salvation through Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets. In the New Testament, the Son of God was sent by the Father, capital F, that's a mistake, lowercase f, to complete divine revelation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God sends his word himself. You know, God spoke in various ways through the prophets, and now he speaks through his son. And in his son communicates everything. He is the very word of God. So the Holy Spirit was then sent by the Father and the Son to sustain and guide the church in guarding and proclaiming God's revelation. Whoops. And so we see God sends the prophets, God sends his son, God sends the Holy Spirit to work in the church. So, one of the terms that we use as Catholics is called the deposit of faith. What is the deposit of faith? Um, the deposit of faith is the heritage of faith contained in scripture, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, handed on in the church from the time of the apostles, from which the magisterium draws all that it proposes for belief as being divinely revealed. So, everything we hold, we must hold as Catholics, is part of the deposit of faith. Everything that Christ has entrusted to the church, everything that the Christ and the apostles through the, power, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has entrusted to the church um, that God wishes communicated throughout all generations is the deposit of faith. And what we believe as Catholics is rooted in that. We don't, we don't believe any, you know, that nothing, uh, nothing the Holy Father can ever say can ever contradict the deposit of faith that was given to us at the time of the apostles. It's okay. Yeah. You have your key. I think I left my keys at work. Okay. There you go. 
It's okay. Jesus still loves you. <laughs> Even if you forget your keys at work. <laughs> Which in this case is, means you lock the keys in the church. <laughs> um, all right. So it's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is an important thing. Public revelation, a.k.a. the deposit of faith, everything that God has wished, everything that God desired to be communicated to the human race, has finished, is closed, is, is, was completed, closed with the death of the last apostle. Our understanding can grow, but divine revelation does not. You know, that's one of the differences between us and the Mormons, for example. Mormons believe that divine revelation can continue. We do not. We believe that the death of the last apostle, everything we believe as Catholics was completed, was handed on, that was given once and for all to the saints. Um, now, the Holy Father can write books and books and books and books and books and books. Saints can write books and books and books and books because our faith is very deep. And we can always, like seeing different aspects of a diamond, we can always grow in our knowledge of it, but that diamond doesn't change. That, what we have doesn't change. Okay. All Christians do not believe this. This is a Catholic belief. Because uh, Protestant Christians, of course, would believe that everything um, that, was, that was proposed was written down in the scriptures, and only what's in the scriptures is the word of God. Uh, the, did they not believe in like, the Holy Spirit? Or? And they believe in the Holy Spirit, but they don't believe that the Holy Spirit works in men to, to clearly define in infallible ways the word of God, or to um, interpret. So they'd say, no, the Holy Spirit just works in you. The Holy Spirit can, can teach you what God wants communicated through the scriptures. But if that disagrees with, with your husband, well, I mean, you know, you're just going to have to go your separate ways because there's really no way to come to an agreement there. Now, there's, so that's, that's the issue then is the Holy Spirit inspired me to say this. Well, the Holy Spirit inspired me to say something completely opposite. Well, who's right? Yeah, that's the problem. Okay. It's okay. Sure. So, for example, one of the things that people ask will say, oh, well, you know, the, the Catholic Church defined this doctrine in 15 whatever, or 22, or, well, 22 hasn't happened yet. Uh, thank you. Um, it defined it in 430, 431 or whatever, this council of whatever. No, we, we, we defend our teachings through the definitions or dogmas of church councils, but we don't create those teachings. Uh, so in the Council of Trent defined what we believed very, very clearly, that it wasn't creating doctrine or dogma, it was just defending it against the Protestant Reformation. In 431, when, um, when the Church Fathers defined very clearly many things about Jesus and Mary and the Holy Trinity and all sorts of things, the Council of Nicaea, uh, it wasn't creating the beliefs, it was defining what the Church always held. And so this is, this is how we know that we have the apostolic faith, that the faith that was given to um, the, the teachings, divine revelation and the means of salvation that was given to by Jesus to the apostles and the Holy Spirit inspired in the apostles is what we hold to today. Same deposit of faith. Um, because in his word, God the Father spoke everything. You can't speak more than Jesus. And so, in Jesus Christ, everything has been revealed, because otherwise, God wouldn't... If, to say that God hadn't revealed something through sending his Son, then, he had, then Jesus is not the fullness of God's revelation. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is the fullness of God's revelation. Yeah. Yes? Can you Sure. Public revelation is that which we must believe. That's what's the, um, given to the entire church and the entire world, revealed by God, uh, that God wishes communicated to all, all people. Private revelation is um, at various levels. You know, when God speaks to an individual person to build up that person or to build up a church. And you do not have to believe the things in private revelation. So when, um, when the Blessed Mother appeared to St. Juan Diego at Tepayac, you know, Our Lady Guadalupe, is a private revelation. Now, most people, including Holy Fathers, believe that in that apparition, would say that there's nothing contrary to the faith in that apparition. But you're not committing a mortal sin 
or you're not a heretic if you say, I'm just not there yet, or um, Lords or Fatima, or let's say, um, you know, let's say Larry comes to me and says, Father Matt, Jesus told me that I need to go to Montana. I'd be like, Larry, Gene's going to kill you. <laughs> so you need to check that revelation at the door. <laughs> but, but I'd say, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, whether I believe it or not, it, it's not, it's not, this doesn't depend on my faith. If, if, if Gene says, I had a vision and, and Mary appeared to me and said that Jesus loves me, I'd say, that's great, that's awesome. But my faith, it's, I'm not going to believe that with the same level of faith as I would believe that there's one God and three persons. Okay? Uh, and, then, and then public revelation is closed. Private revelation? Public revelation is closed. Private revelation can happen. And I'd say at some level, private, private revelation I mean, should happen on a daily basis. Every day, God should be speaking something to you heart, your heart. Uh, you know, it should, it should be, every time you go to Mass... There is a, a form, it's you know, a little, little um, metaphorical, but a form of private revelation. God is speaking to your heart through, through the preaching of that public revelation. He can say something to our soul. Usually when people mean private revelation, they mean like the apparitions of Our Lady or Jesus appearing to, to St. Mar- Mar- Margaret Mary Alacoque or Jesus appearing to St. Um, Faustina, those types of things that can either be approved by the church and when they're approved by the church, it doesn't, it doesn't say you have to believe them. They say there's no... no there's nothing contrary to the faith, and it looks like there could be some supernatural origin there. Um, or, the, or they could say, come out and say, no, this is contrary to the faith. So That's where people um, can, can go astray, is by always looking for all these private revelations. Have you heard about this latest Marian apparition in, in, um, in Cincinnati, or this Mar- Marian apparition in, in Hudson, you know? Whatever, you know, there's, I mean, I'm not, I'm just referring to random towns like Hudson's, the town I grew up in. Um, uh, or Mary appeared in the toast. You know, no, it, they start chasing all these private revelations and you ask them, well, when's the last time you picked up the Gospels and read it? You know, they're chasing private revelations but missing public revelation. That's a problem. That's a real problem. They're going to be easily picked astray, picked off. All right. So, handing down the Word of God. Jesus preached the gospel, fulfilled it by his life, death, and resurrection. Of course, we all know that. Jesus entrusted the gospel to the apostles and gave them authority to speak in his name. That's what we talked about last time. And we talked about Luke 10, 16. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. And so this fullness of revelation was handed on to the apostles, we can see in two modes. Right then, at that time, when Jesus is giving the word of God to them, what do they have? What's the mode of transmitting the good news? When Jesus sends them out to preach the gospel, what do they have access to as the ways of communicating? Well, they have the writings of the Old Testament. The word of God is written down in the Old Testament. And they have oral tradition, all that Christ taught them. He said, go say these things. And that's oral tradition. Um, tradition, you know, comes from trottere, to hand over, to hand on. Uh, that's where we get words like betray or tradition, you know, hand over. And so these two modes are protected infallibly by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God in the Old Testament and the Word of God that is being proclaimed by the apostles. So this is where we get scripture and tradition, the two modes of communicating divine re- or transmitting divine revelation. This is the core Catholic belief is what happened with Jesus and the apostles is still the modes of communication that we have today. Scripture and tradition. And this ministry of teaching and guarding the faith was then passed on to their successors, the bishops of the church. John 16, 13 through 14 and 14, 26 is when Jesus says, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Oh, wait. Um... The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix up the two verses. The um, 16 is, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truths. For he will, speak on his own, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And then John 14, 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Okay. 
And so we talked about last time apostolic succession, that the office of apostle was passed on both to Matthias and Paul and then the further bishops of the church. We talked about all of that. So we see this ministry, this mission of, of, of handing on and guarding the faith. Okay. The, um, oh, then we see this clearly in Matthew 16, 13 through 20, when Jesus says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So Jesus gave Peter the authority of binding and loosing. We see that here. And that apostolic authority that the Holy Spirit has sent to the apostles to keep the faith. I quoted that scripture passage already. The apostles speak with the authority of the Holy Spirit. I talked about this last time. For it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Acts 15.28 and they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem, Acts 16.4. We talked about this last time. And so the church then becomes the ark preserving God's revelation. Okay. The church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of truth. I think we talked about this one as, as well last time. When you ask someone, what's the pillar and bulwark or pillar and foundation of truth about God? They'll say, the Bible and we'd say 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is the pillar and foundation of church, truth. And the church can't be, if it's going to be a pillar, it can't be a nebulous group of like-minded believers all reading the Bible and interpreting it differently. It must be an actual group that you could go to and actually be a pillar, an actual foundation. Something like the apostles. Okay. And then part of this whole mission of transmitting divine revelation, as we talked about last time, is Matthew 28, the great commissioning. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the world. We see a very Catholic mission statement there. That it doesn't say, go write a Bible and start passing it out. He says, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them. Not by writing, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Oral tradition. Make disciples. You know, that's, that's, that's where we get Jesus' mission to the apostles is they have the Old Testament. They haven't written the New Testament yet. They're called to go make disciples. He doesn't tell them to go write. Jesus never wrote a chapter in a book. Uh, he preached. And he sends out men, fallible, um, uh, sinful men, who have this gift of infallibility, uh, but they are not perfect. They have this charism. The Holy Spirit's going to protect them so the Holy Spirit can work in the midst of them and, and preserve the truth, though they are frail people. Uh, and that's one of the big differences is, you know, for a non-Catholic Christian, for a Protestant Christian, they'd say, well, you know, you just can't trust men are, you know, men, us humans, we're weak, we're failures, we're sinful, therefore you just, we just can't trust it. Well, Jesus did. Jesus sent out the apostles. Go, therefore. If he didn't trust them, why wouldn't he should have, then he should have written the New Testament himself and started telling them just to make copies and handing them out. No, he didn't do that. He entrusted the gospel to them, to men. Knowing that his Holy, the Holy Spirit was powerful enough to preserve his teachings. Okay, so who are the, so the three pillars of divine revelation the three the three the two modes we talked about the two modes are sacred scripture and sacred tradition but the pillars we also need one other one which is the apostolic ministry the apostles which is now called the magisterium magisterium comes from the latin word magister which means to teach to teach a magister the teaching authority of the church so i think this is a really important point what is sacred tradition it's a very very catholic point Holy tradition or sacred tradition is the entire deposit of faith. Everything that God has communicated in the deposit of faith is contained in holy tradition, and some of it was written down in Scripture. So, this is from the Catechism, paragraph 81. And holy tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ, the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles, so that enlightened by the Spirit of truth, 
they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. Um, so scripture and tradition are not two disconnected things. You've got what's in scripture here and what's tradition over here. Sometimes I think, even us as Catholics, we can get that idea. Well, it's not in the Bible, it's in tradition. Everything is in tradition. You know, the New Testament came from sacred tradition. Everything is contained within sacred, sacred tradition. Um, and then it's going to be defended or validated by, by the scriptures because the scriptures, the New Testament, came out of sacred tradition. The people that are writing the New Testament already had divine revelation. That's how they could write it. They already had it. So it's not like these two separate things. Tradition communicates entirely. Okay, so this is the Catholic view. What's the Protestant view? Protestant view is sola scriptura, which just means the Bible alone. I talked about this. The, the Bible is the only authority of God's word. There's no such thing as tradition. Traditions are all man-made things. They're all corrupt and evil. There's no hierarchy, no priesthood, no authority. It's the Bible alone. Just read it and figure it out. The problem is, where does it say that in the Bible? You know, just like, um, just like when someone asks you, or says to you, there's no such thing as truth, what's the response? Yeah. Is that true? <laughs> is that true? There, the Bible is the only authority. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't, actually. Uh, it's, that's, so it's called self-referentially inconsistent. When you apply it to itself, it falls apart. Um, okay, so their view, a little, little diagram here, is, okay, if we look at, okay, G, at Jesus' time, of course, like I said, they have the Old Testament, the Scripture, the Old Testament, and the tradition, everything that he's handing on, all the stuff, all the teachings, all the preachings, the miracles, everything that he is handing on, he gives to the apostles, they receive that Scripture and tradition. So the Word of God is communicated through those things. That's what the apostles have. And so one of the Protestant visions is then, um, that they start writing things down, they start writing scripture down, and so tradition starts to decrease, basically, and once everything is written, once everything, quote-unquote, everything that God wishes communicated is written down, then tradition ceases, it goes away, it's no longer um, exist, in existence, and all you got is the Bible. Again, you ask, where do we see that in the Bible? If that's your presupposition, prove it. Prove that it happened. Show me in the Acts of the Apostles where it happened. Because if it ain't in the Bible, I don't have to believe it. Can you show me where that collapse happened? I see this very clearly in the Scriptures, but can you show me in the Scriptures where that happened? Again, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. If they're making a claim, all you got to do is say, prove it. Show me a single passage. Okay. All right. So, now... So let's talk about some of the um, arguments that they'll make. First, one of the things they'll say is, well, Jesus condemns traditions, right? You know, he condemns people for holding to their traditions and forsaking God's words. Um, In Matthew 15, 3, Jesus answered them, And why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Also in Mark 7, 9, Colossians 2, 8. So you see, Jesus condemns tradition. So you hold, that you've been talking about all this tradition stuff. Is, you're contrary to what Jesus is saying. Okay. Well, there's a huge difference between man-made traditions that are contrary to God's word and traditio, the handing on of the deposit of faith. So, and when Jesus is preaching, and he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Matthew turns around and says, Thus says the Lord, Blessed are the pure in heart. Is that a man-made tradition, or is that the word of God? That's the word of Jesus Christ. It's the word of God. Uh, that's not a man, that's not a, that's a divine, divine man-made, uh, God-man-made made statement. Now, if he turns around, if, if Matthew turns around and says, Blessed are those who rob banks and hit people. You know, then that's a man-made tradition contrary to God's word, of course. Or they say, you know, what you really need to do is you need to um, give to the temple even if it means you can't provide for your own parents. No, that's, a, that's going against honor your mother and father. And Jesus condemns, 
condemns man-made traditions that are contrary to his word. He doesn't say that there's no such thing as divinely established tradition. Because it all starts out as tradition. Scripture itself points to tradition. I command you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. 1 Corinthians 11.2 2 Thessalonians 2.15 So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Doesn't get more explicit than that. Word of mouth by letter. Boom. Hold to the traditions. Now we command you, command you brother, in the name of the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 3 6, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not according to the tradition that you have received from us. And even the, even the Bible itself, the canon, the list of the books, is a proof of the authority of the Catholic Church. And what people don't realize, I think it's really important, is when you have, whenever anyone picks up a Bible, they are validating the authority of the Catholic Church. And you ask them, for example, um, where in the Bible does it list what books should be there? I think most, most Protestants have never even thought about that question. They just be like, well, it's, this is the, it's the Bible, it's right here. Yeah, but the Bible is a collection of books. You know, written over hundreds of years in many different places by many different people. You know, you've got Jeremiah's writings, you've got Isaiah's writings. Who says that they're both inspired by God and should be in this book? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How do you, why do you believe that the Gospel of Matthew is written by Matthew? Read it. It doesn't say it's written by Matthew. But it says the Gospel of Matthew right at the top. Look at that. No, that's what we write. We write on there. Gospel of Matthew. Why do we believe that it's inspired by God. Well, it talks about Jesus. Yes, but so did a lot of things at that time. Not at now, or around that time. There's writings in the two or three hundreds. You know, isn't that close enough? I mean, all these Gnostic texts. Why do you believe that the Gospel of Matthew is, is not, not only writing about Jesus, but is actually the Word of God versus just a good, just a good, um, uh, just a good writing? Doesn't say it's written by God. Doesn't say it's inspired by God. No. So this is one of the words we say. Well, the early church believed it. I'd say exactly. Yeah. See it, RCIA. <laughs> <laughs> so you trust that the early church got it right? Yes. So would you say that there that that the early church was infallible in this putting together of the Bible? inspired by God and infallible in putting this together? Yes. Because if they say no, then they don't believe in the infallibility of the Bible. That's then, so then you don't know if the Bible is actually infallible then because if, if the books aren't in it, if it's not an infallible thing to have the books in it, then maybe one shouldn't be in there. Or maybe there should be more in there. Now, if you believe that it was an infallible thing, is divine, is perfect, not you know, without error, inspired by God, that what the early church put together, then you believe in an authoritative magisterium, which we like to call the Catholic Church. And it's, it's A equals A. So it's a proof for the need of sacred tradition and a magisterium. Um, so I want to talk about how, how did the Bible come to be? Or how did the books get in there? Uh, now, as I mentioned, the Bible is not a single work that one man wrote, but a collection of many, te- many texts History, poetry, songs, genealogies, law books, letters, biographies, written by many authors over an extended period of time. And if each book in the Bible didn't say that it was inspired by God and should be included in this book called the Bible, then you've got to rely on something else for that authority, which we call Catholic tradition. So, um, So when did all this come about? So Pope, Pope Damasus is the one who made an official decree in, in 382 codifying the books of the Bible. Um, we see before that, uh, the 16th, from the 60th canon of the Council of Laodicea held in 360, uh, we have the church's first official list of the Old Testament books, even though it does eventually it does omit other books that will be eventually part of the canon. 
So it's giving, these are the books that are inspired by God. It's not saying that these are the only ones. So Pope, the Pope creates the list. Not, after, not long after this, this decree, um, his successor, Pope Innocent I, also names the same corpus of 46 Old Testament books in an encyclical on February 20th, 405. Likewise, the Plenary Council of Hippo in 393 promulgated the same list of Old Testament books. Only four years later, the Third Council of Carthage endorsed the same as did the Fourth Council of Carthage in 419. And although these were not, though those were not ecumenical councils, they nonetheless demonstrated an increasing consistency in the Church's official position. Of course, the Council of Florence in the 1400s, Council of Trent in the 1500s, of course, repeat all of that. So, the, the, the canon, the list of books, wasn't put together until the three and four hundreds. Because, I mean, and it's a di- whole different mentality. We have the printing press. You can buy a Bible for four bucks now. Back in the day, handwritten copies, didn't have printing press, handwritten copies on parchment or vellum. I mean, you had to be rich to old, own, a, own a text. People say, oh, well, see, the, the Catholic Church chained up the Bible. You know, so people couldn't read it. No, they chained it up so people couldn't walk off with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you had a pile of, you know, something, a great treasure, just like we do now, a great treasure s- sitting in the middle of the church, you're going to make sure people can't just walk up and take it. You know, um, it's the same with museums and stuff. It's not trying to keep people out of the Bible. It's trying to keep people from stealing the Bible. Uh, you know, because they didn't have... I mean, you'd have to be, you'd be extremely rich to have a whole text or you copied it yourself. And, and so, I mean, imagine, imagine if all this parish had was the Gospel of Matthew. And you'd hear about these other texts, but you never actually saw them with your own eyes. It's a different mindset, but that's how it was in the early church. I mean, they were passing these letters around. I mean, there were people trying to copy them, but they didn't have just what we take for granted. You're like, boom, buy a, you can buy a Bible, it's... You know, the, in your hotel room when you go, go on a vacation. I mean, we have such access. I have how many versions of the Bible on my phone? You know, probably all of them. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's just, we have such access to the Word of God now that um, we take it for granted. Okay. Uh, so I'll c- go through a couple other um, scriptures that people will use in argument against um, Catholic tradition and, and magisterium in support of uh, Sola Scriptura. One of the ones that I've heard a lot is 1 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in the righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So you see, you're complete. Scripture is inspired by God. It makes you complete. It's all you need. Or thoroughly furnished for every good work. You're thoroughly furnished. You're complete. That's all you need. Is that the proof for Sola Scriptura? That the man of God may be complete. May be complete. So, it's saying that Scripture is inspired by God. It doesn't say that only Scripture is inspired by God. Be like, amen, of course Scripture is inspired by God. We believe that. But that doesn't mean it's only the only thing. May be complete. Means that you need it to be complete. Not that it is the only thing that makes you complete. So, I'll give you an example. Just got to turn this. Uh, so let's say I'm setting up for dinner. You know, we're serving pizza, and uh, yeah. and I, I say to you, "All right, we got now. Once we have these forks here, we are complete. We are ready for a good meal. Thoroughly furnished for a good meal." Does that mean it's the the forks are the only thing that are on that table? No, you got plates, you got napkins, you got cups, you got drinks. It's saying, it's saying that you're not, you're not complete without the fork, but it doesn't mean that you're only. It's, it doesn't imply, it doesn't follow that it's the only thing that you need. So yes, a person is thoroughly furnished. They may be com- they they um, they need the scriptures to be complete, but it's not the scriptures alone that makes them complete. If that were true. And, it was the, and the scriptures made you complete for every good work, then you don't need Jesus Christ. <laughs> of course you need Jesus Christ to be complete for every good work, don't you? Do you need faith? Yes. Do you need air? Yes. <laughs> Do you need grace? Yes. Of course. Do you need love? Yes. So, see how it can't possibly follow. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're complete, then you don't even need love. Well, no, you are. Okay. 
Another scripture, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. I've applied all this to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brethren, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. See, you cannot go beyond what's written. Sola Scriptura, Bible alone, cannot go beyond. Don't go beyond what's written. Now again, an easy way, an easy way to discount 99.9% of things in, in our tax on our faith. Read a couple verses before and a couple verses after. Context tells you exactly. If you take any scripture out of context, you're going to go way off the mark. There's a, there's a line in the Bible that says there is no God. Read, the, read, read, a few line, read a few words before it. The fool in his heart says there is no God. You know? And so, yeah, any passage taken out of context can, can say all sorts of crazy things. So, first thing is you just look at the Greek. The Greek is gegraphitai, which is a perfect tense, meaning a past completed action. What has been written in a past completed way. He's referring to what he's previously told them, previously written. Don't go beyond what I told you. And if that were the case, then you would not be able to go beyond 1 Corinthians, which means you wouldn't have the Gospels. The Gospels hadn't been written yet. So if you look at the context, don't go beyond what's written, okay? Gospels haven't been written yet, so we can't go beyond what's written. Uh, well, no. He's saying, don't go beyond what I'm telling you, thinking you're all, all that, you know, and you're getting puffed up and leading people astray. Just, just do what I'm saying. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. See, these are written that you may believe, that's, therefore it's all you need. It's, it was, this is what they wrote, so that you may believe. Boom, you're done. Source of your belief. They, so they'll say that it's all you need for faith. If that's true, then, you would, then all you would need was John's writings. Again, it's, a, it's, an underst- it's taking things out of context. The Bible wasn't put together until 250-some years after this was written. And so, if, if this was the case, and you have, all you have is John's Gospel there, and it's, not, it's you know, 90 or 100 A.D., it's like, well, that's all I need is John's Gospel. Oh, but no, he was writing with a, with a vision to the future. What, 200 years into the future? So what was going on for those before the 200 years? No, and to say, um, but then also just the context. These are written that you may believe. It's to help us believe, not that it's the only thing you need for divine revelation. Another scripture, Romans 3, 4. I remember that was very vividly, you know, getting into a whole conversation of street preaching with um, and I was kind of surrounded by United, some United Pentecostals, and we we're talking about Scripture. And it was the first time I actually heard this verse that uh, used in a way for sola scriptura. It said, "Let God be, let God be true, though every man be a liar. Let God be true, though every man be false. Therefore, you cannot trust the Pope, cannot trust the bishops. Let God be true, though every man's a liar." It's like, I remember thinking, "What? <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> People actually wrote the Bible. So that doesn't make sense." So. Again, you just read the verse before. What is, look at the context. Verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? Let God be true, though every man be false. So God will be faithful, though every person, if, even if every person on the face of the planet was false, God will still be faithful. That's the context. He's not talking about divine revelation. He's talking about God's fidelity. And if that were actually taken literally, then it means we can't trust any man, even those who wrote the Bible. There was some physical person's hand writing the page and claimed that this was inspired by God. We wouldn't be able to, teach, we wouldn't be able to trust them. When, when the apostles get up and say, this is what the Holy Spirit tells us, we wouldn't be able to trust that. Okay. Now we talked, uh, I think, hmm, I'm kind of forgetting which, which groups I've told what to. Did we, we talked about the reliability of the scriptures, right? And how we can trust them as historical texts. Yes? Okay. So just a quick review, Old Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls that date back to 100 B.C. show almost no deviation from the Masoretic text of 900 A.D. Mm-hmm. New Testament, we got fragments from 130. And the early church fathers that quote the New Testament and all those things correlate. It's the way we know that things haven't been corrupted. Um, oh, 
I'm kind of I jumped around. The slides are out of order. Another scripture passage that they'll use is Revelation 22, 18 through 19. I've heard this quite a bit. I warn every one of you who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. See, you can't add to the word of God. Your traditions, they add to the word of God. So our response is first, um, Scripture, yes. Yeah, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. You know, they say slow scripture, but then they toss books out of the Bible. <laughs> what? Surprises out. Oh, yeah, the surprises out. Yeah, <laughs> cats out of the bag on that one. No. Um, so they'll say, see, you can't add to the add to the Bible because the book says if you do the Bible says if you do that, there's going to be plagues and all sorts of things. First, the context is speaking of the Book of Revelation. The books, the you know the the. Um, the words of the book of this prophecy. The whole Bible hadn't put together, been put together for 200 and some more years. The words of the book of this prophecy. It's a prophecy about the end of the world. Don't change the word of God. He's not saying that you can't add to it. Because if that were the case, then it should have stopped in Deuteronomy 4 too, when Moses said the exact same thing. Anyone who adds to the words of this book and talks about the prophecies. So the Bible should have ended at Deuteronomy 4 too, if that were true. So it wasn't true in 4.2. It can't be true in, in, in Revelation 22, 18 through 19. So it's misinterpretation. <laughs> now, your question. Why do Catholics have more books in their Bible than Protestants? Well, we would, obviously that's a loaded phrase. We'd say, why do Protestants have less books in the Bible than the Catholics? Um, so the New Testament is the same, same, same 26 books. Uh, but the Old Testament is different. There are seven, in the Catholic Old Testament, has seven more books called the Deuterocanonicals, or the second list, or second canon. Uh, now, uh, there were two versions of the Old Testament at use, in use at the time of Christ, with differing canons, the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew canon. The early church, which is mostly a Greek-speaking world, used the Septuagint in the New Testament. So when they're, when they're citing Old Testament quotes in the New Testament, the vast majority of the time they're using the Greek Septuagint translation. The G- and so how did this all come about? Well, in 90 AD, after the temple was destroyed, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was obliterated and destroyed by the Romans, has not been rebuilt. That's what the Wailing Wall is. The Wailing Wall is part of the temple wall, the only remaining part. Um, the, the, the Jewish leaders gathered in a cult, what's called the Council of Jamnia, and they tried to figure out how we're going to be uh, the Jewish people now? How are we going to constitute our religion? Now that temple sacrifice is gone, the temple's gone, what are we going to do? And so they came up with many things, and one of the things that they talked about was the Old Testament and the canon, the list of books. And they chose the Hebrew canon because the Christians were using the Greek one. Uh, they rejected the canon used by the Christians, and so that they used only those books that were in Hebrew. And so for the, for the early... For 1,500 years, when you, were, when you were referring to the scriptures, it was the church, not the Council of Jamnia people. The church was using the list, the list of books that we have today. It wasn't until Martin Luther came along that said, we've got to throw out these books because they contradict um, what, I, what I'm saying, and they're not in Hebrew, so therefore we're going to toss them. We're going to throw them out. And they... And, yeah, they do contradict his fundamental belief system. Oops. And that's why he threw them out? Uh, he, I mean, he wouldn't, of course he wouldn't admit that as the reason he threw them out. He was arguing that the Hebrew canon was authoritative. Uh-huh. Okay. And we'd say, well, that's, but that's the canon that the people chose in rebellion against Christianity. Christianity. Why would you go with that one? Uh, there it is. So... Christianity always used the Septuagint canon until Martin Luther. Uh, so there are places, um, Luther actually also tried, to, tried but failed to throw out the Epistle of James, which he called an Epistle of Straw, and the Book of Revelation. Oh, uh, no, I think he also, well, I can't remember. 
Oh, my slides don't have it, so I better not say it. Cause, and try to throw out the letter of Hebrews, but I thought he also tried to throw out the book of Revelation because he said it wasn't revealing. It was confusing. But I could be, I could be wrong on that. Yeah, so, um, and say, well, here you are trying to throw all these things out because obviously the epistle of James con- contradicts the whole, faith, the whole faith alone and not works. He says faith without works is dead. Uh, Second Maccabees, First and Second Maccabees talks about um, the Book of Maccabees tar- talks about praying for the dead, and that it's benefit it's beneficial to pray for the dead. Well, that contradicts his entire theology of salvation, because if you if you if you can pray for souls in purgatory, that means that salvation works differently. For Martin Luther, salvation was it was imputed righteousness. Jesus just covers you, covers your corruptness. You are totally depraved of goodness. Nothing good in you. At all, garbage, poo, crap, you know, whatever word you want to use, and that Christ's righteousness just covers you, like snow covering a dunghill. That's salvation. It's called imputed righteousness. He just declares you righteous, even though you're not, even though you're corrupt completely. Whereas Catholics, of course, so in that, that vision, you don't need purgatory. There's nothing to fix. You just are, live in heaven as a corrupted but covered individual. Of course, the Catholic vision is that we're not corrupt. We're we are born with, with the law, we are born without divine life, without the grace of original justice and holiness. We're born without sanctifying grace. That's what original sin is, and that we can and we are inclined to sin. So our nature is inclined to sin, but we are not corrupt. We still have goodness. We're still made in the image of God, and so salvation is God infusing righteousness in us, infused righteousness, that He actually makes us holy, sanctifying grace. And that in heaven we are actually perfect, perfected. His grace perfects us. Uh, it doesn't cover us, it infuses, infiltrates us. Okay. So, uh, now just talking a little bit about the scriptures. Scripture was inspired. Scripture was, in writ, was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by human authors who wrote exactly what God wanted written for our salvation. Written by many authors over a thousand years. And scripture must be read and interpreted as a unity within the tradition of the church. Now, you know, Catholics sometimes say, well, I don't read the Bible. I'm worried about misinterpreting it. Learn, you know, if you know your Catholic faith and you read the Bible within the, the, the unity of the tradition, then you're not going to go astray. You know, that's, um, we have the authentic tr- interpretation of the scriptures. It's our Catholic faith because that's what it came from. Yes, Matthew. Um, well, that's putting, that's making, I don't, I don't think you're intending this, but that's actually making two things opposed. That's saying, yeah. read your Bible, uh, if you have to choose, you know, between knowing your faith and knowing the Bible, you know the Bible. Uh-huh. Well, no, the, the, the Bible is the Catholic faith. It's our book. It, sure, it sure. is, it is, it came out of Catholic tradition, out of our, out of our tradition. So you have to learn both. You know, we, we, have to, we have to learn we have to learn our Catholic faith. We learn the scriptures, which is the word of God, which is the inspired word of God. So you know both. I mean, read the Bible, read the catechism, you know. But we don't have to be afraid of that because we always, we, when we're looking at a scripture passage, if we come across something that seems at first glance, does this contradict what I believe? Well, then we, we find the answer. You know, that's where reading a, a scripture with a good commentary, like the one Ignatius Press puts out, the Ignatius Bible that has all the different commentaries in it, or the Navarre Bible, that's going to help us, if, if people are really scared of, of going astray, or you go to one of the Bible studies at St. Peter's, you know, or, um, uh, but and, and any Catholic um, can pick up the scriptures, pick up the Gospels, and start reading. Of course it's going to inspire questions. No matter who you are on this planet, the, if you read the Bible without having a single question about God, <laughs> you were not reading the Bible. You know, it's going to inspire questions. That's 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 how we are engaged. 
but we just go, where do we go for the answers? We don't go to, well, I just think it means this. That's, that's a guess. You know, we say, what does the church have to say? Um, what does the church have to say? You know, what, are the, what do the fathers of the church say? And that can be really inspiring. So we're, we're learning about the interpretation of the scriptures through reading it. Yeah? I'll wait until question. Okay, wait until question and answer time. Thanks. So scri- sacred tradition, I think, um, I think Pope Benedict said this when he was cardinal, before he became pope. He said that, um, this isn't an exact quote, but that sacred tradition is the proper interpretation of Scripture. That's what it is. So, so. And so it must be interpreted as intended. It's not a physics book. It's a theology book. It's God's Word. Um, it tells the story of salvation, which is a revelation of God's steadfast love, His guidance, His mercy, and, its, and, the, and fullness, faithfulness. Of course, the center of Scripture is Jesus Christ. And then, you know, when we're looking at the interpretations of Scripture, you have these, these four senses... Uh, the Catechism talks about this. The four senses, the literal. Like we do believe in the literal interpretation. When Jesus raised someone from the dead, he was physically raising someone from the dead. And then the Christological or allegorical, how does this relate to Christ? So when Moses raised up this bronze serpent on a staff and had people look at it, how does it relate to Christ? Well, Jesus says, just as Moses raises the, up the serpent, so too the Son of Man will be raised up. And so he's raised up on a pole or cr- a cross. What does it teach us about the moral life, how we are to live? You know, so when Jonah gets swallowed by a whale, what does it teach us about moral life? Don't disobey God. <laughs> You'll get swallowed by a whale. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then the eschatological or anagogical, how does it relate to eternal significance, heaven and hell, eternal end of time type stuff? How does this relate to the end of the world? Okay. Why is all this important? Well, because, we're, again, we're called to conform ourselves to the truth, not try to conform the truth to ourselves. We're called uh, to conform ourselves to the truth, both in nature and revelation. And the Catholic view of revelation holds us accountable and keeps us away from being lords of the truth. One of the things I love about being Catholic is that there's one pope, not a billion. <laughs> we are not our own popes. That's, I mean, that's basically what Sola Scriptura says. Here's the Bible. Be your own pope. Decide for yourselves can't really trust anybody because everybody's, everybody's a sinner, so you can't really trust anybody else's interpretation. If you want to go to church and listen to pastor so-and-so say this about Scripture, you can do that, but there's no real way to know for sure that he's right unless you, you just got to read it yourself. Then everybody's their own pope, and it's a pretty terrifying mentality. Is that going to bring unity? No. It's going to bring division, and that's what happens. 40,000 denominations of, Christian, of Protestant Christians, 40,000, versus one unified way. You want to know what God's Word says? Here it is. What does that mean? You go to the Pope. You know for sure. Case closed. Buck stops with him. End of discussion. Boom. It's easier to believe that God wishes there to be one Pope rather than six billion. It's a greater vision for the love of God. So I have talked about this last time. What's, what's the greater vision of the love of God? That God says, here's a book, figure it out, good luck with that. Don't trust anybody else. Or here's a church, here's everything, here's all the divine revelation, here's how you know for sure, an infallible way to know what, what my word is. Here's a, a, a church that's not going to have the gates of hell prevail against it. It's going to be here for, until the end of time. Here's all the teachings of the church. Boom. Now you just got to live it. You know, that's a much greater, greater vision of God's love. Um, and a wise man builds his house on rock. I think this story is just, it's just awesome. It's just um, it's a lot of divine irony. You know, Jesus says, the fool builds his house on sand. Wise man builds his house on rock. What does Peter mean? Rock. Wise man builds his house on rock. Peter. God wishes to reveal himself to us and share his own divine life and love with us in all of these different ways. Yeah. Okay, so to summarize, three pillars of Revelation, sacred tradition, the living transmission of the entirety of Revelation by the successors of the apostles under the guidance and protection of the Holy Spirit, sacred scripture, the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit, and then the magisterium, which is the teaching authority of the church, the pope and the bishops, who are the successors of the apostles, and that the interpretation of scripture must be in union with sacred tradition and the whole of scripture. Some good books to read um, if you're looking for stuff on this. One is by Scott Hahn, A Father Who Keeps His Promises. You want to learn a good 
kind of a good um, overview of the entire Bible. It's just he goes through the covenants, beautifully well written. Uh, you, can, you can understand the Bible by P, Dr. Peter Kreeft. Another good one, he just goes through each book. And so if you're reading like the book of Jeremiah, or you see the first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, you're like, what time did Isaiah live? I kind of forget in the context. Was he at the time of the Assyrian exile, the Babylonian exile? What, what was going on there? You just open it up and, oh, Isaiah, okay, boom, 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 boom. Here it is. Where is that in the Bible? By, Peter, uh, by Patrick Madrid. Uh, Walk, a new one that's came out, Walking with God, by Jeff Cabins, kind of similar to A Father Who Keeps His Promise. Jeff Cabins is the one who did the Bible timeline. And then, uh, of course, you can go to Catholic.com for a lot of other good resources on the faith.